Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning service from Copplestone Methodist Church. Welcome to our church family and to anyone else who is watching and joining with us this morning. We're so glad to have you with us. Today is Remembrance Sunday, a special day. <laughs> yes, I was just busy cleaning my father's war medals, 1914 to 1918. It's a long time ago, isn't it? A very long time ago, and many others have died in conflict since then. Many have given their lives that we might know freedom, and it's right and proper that we should show our gratitude today. Why do I clean those medals every Armistice Sunday? It helps me to focus. And I suppose the, the thing that helps most of us to focus today, we, we can't do. We can't go and join with the company at the War Memorial, or be at a special Remembrance Day service. But we can still remember. And that's what we're gathered together to do this morning. And so, in the name of our church, I just welcome all of you to our service today. It's going to be led by Nana, and our preacher this morning is Chris. And so we really look forward to a special time together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this annual opportunity to remember those who, without thought for themselves, gave their lives that we might have freedom. And Father, we just express our gratitude, our thanksgiving today. But Father, above all, we Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for our freedom. Yes, for freedom from sin. Father, thank you for Jesus. And as we remember the fallen among our brethren, we also give you praise and glory for the death of your Son. In your name. Amen.
sing for joy, abide with me. Soldiers fought and battles won for peace on earth until the fighting's done. They left their homes and said goodbye to fight a war. The mothers left.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, For your tomorrow, we gave our today. And the poem. Why are they selling poppies, mummy? Selling poppies in town today. The poppies, child, are flowers of love for those who have marched away. But why have they chosen a puppy, mummy? Why not a beautiful rose? Because, my child, men fought and died in the fields where the poppies grow. And why are the poppies so red, mummy? Why are the poppies so red? Red is the colour of blood, my child, the blood so many have shed. The heart of the puppy is black, mummy. Why does it have to be black? Black, my child, is the symbol of grief for those who never came back. But, mummy, why are you crying so? Your tears are causing me pain. My tears are my fears for you, my child, for the world is forgetting again. Father God, help us never to forget those who earned our freedom, those gone before, who, like your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, gave up their lives because they loved. Almighty and eternal God, from whose love in Christ we can, can never be parted, either by death or life, Hear our prayers for all we remember this day. Fulfill in them the purpose of your love and bring us all with them to your eternal joy. Loving, gracious, heavenly Father, as we today on Remembrance Sunday reflect and remember those who have gone before. We also think of and thank you for the dedicated men and women who serve in our armed forces today. We so easily forget that the hard-earned peace we all have the privilege of living in still needs to be maintained by such people, often serving in harm's way to protect the liberties we enjoy. Your word tells us, Father, no greater love has man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This Lord is surely the ultimate example of being like Christ. Perhaps those who go to fight never see it this way, but nailed to a cross weeping, your son certainly did. He gave up his life so we may be free. Freer in a far greater sense than the worldly freedom earned at such a cost by those we remember today. He gave his life so we may be free to be. Free to be the people you gifted us to be. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, when we take that freedom lightly and live our lives as if Christ's sacrifice never happened. Forgive the people of this nation, Father, who largely have forgotten that amazing sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. Jesus, the Saviour, this gospel to tell, joyfully came, came with the helpless and hopeless to dwell, sharing their sorrow and shame, seeking the lost, saving, redeeming at measureless cost. Jesus is seeking the wanderers yet. Why do they roam? Love only waits to forgive and forget. Home, weary wanderers, home. Wonderful love dwells in the heart of the Father above. He called out to you, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And still that call echoes down the ages. Forgive us all, Father, 
for truly we know not what we do. Sometimes, Father, perhaps far too often, we simply lose sight of the wonder of your Son and his sacrifice for us. Help us all to be living examples of love, dying to self to help others to be, just as Jesus died to himself to let us be. Empower us in this spiritual battle to be light shining in the darkness, reminding the people around us, the people of this land, that Christ's sacrifice was for them as well as us. And in the sacrificial death and resurrection of Christ, they too can find true freedom. Amen. The reading is from Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, and his life was cut short in midstream but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. It's so good, isn't it, to remember and just to take some time to think about the sacrifices that so many gave for us, that we can live in relative freedom Um, that we have today and be able to do the things that we choose to do. I know at the moment we're into a new lockdown and for some of you that's going to be really hard but still in comparison with lots of parts of this world we have an amazing freedom and it got me thinking about memories and remembering and for me often when I remember things it's a really good time to be grateful and I thought about um, a book, a little book that I made for Phil when we've been married 25 years yeah there we are I made this little book um and there's loads of memories in this book there's loads of different photos of different things and I was just kind of like looking through them there's some of the boys and this I came across this one and it's just at the bottom there hopefully you can see that and that's a youth weekend uh from many years ago and some of you will recognize yourself in that and it just got me remembering about all the good times we had and all the things that God had blessed and all the things that um, God had done and and the ways that he has used many of those young people um, to further his kingdom. And I just wanted to encourage you this morning as we remember to be thankful, to be thankful to God for his provision and for the way that he has kept us through the years. And I know Kids Zone, you've been uh, also remembering something this week. You've had a verse to learn. And so I thought it'd be really good if we could just say that one together now. And I'm just going to count from three down to one and then we'll say that verse together. So kids, are you ready? I hope you are. Three, two, one. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 19. And what a great verse. What a verse for a time like this. A verse that promises that God will meet all our needs 
we may think that there are things that we need, but often they're just wants. But God promises that he will meet all our needs. In a minute, we're going to hear from Sean, who's going to speak to the kids. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I love the kids bit. I find that it's normally really cool. And if there's an action song, I love getting involved. So Sean, over to you. Well, good morning. Uh, I want to uh, speak to the children this morning just for a little bit. Uh, apologies, I'm outside, as you've probably guessed, and uh, it's a little bit windy, so hopefully it's not too loud on the video. But I want to introduce you to someone uh, or something this morning that we've kind of uh, adopted. It's an animal we've kind of adopted over the past few months. And, uh, and she's right behind me, and I'm going to see if we can kind of go and uh, get a bit closer to her. This is Coffee. This one, this one right here nearest us. Uh, she's called Coffee. I say she, I think it's a girl, I don't really know. Uh, she is, well, I'd like to think you figured out that she's a sheep, but she's a very tame sheep. And I'm gonna see if we can come up next. So there's a few others here in the background, but they're not quite so um, brave as Coffee. Let's see if we can. <laughs> Hi Coffee, here you go, this is Coffee. And uh, Coffee is, uh, a, Coffee's a very, very tame sheep. Here she is. You gonna say something? No, she's got nothing to say. But um, Coffee's kind of been. Oh, hello. <laughs> Coffee's kind of been uh, adopted by our um, our family over the last few months. A lady put some sheep in the field, um, about twenty or thirty sheep in, and um, Louis really took to one of them this one here and uh, she's actually left this sheep behind with a couple of others um, because she didn't want to take it away from Louis my, my six-year-old son so uh, coffee's lovely and you know we haven't got a pet she you knows coffee's not a pet but we haven't we haven't got a pet um, but I know a lot of you do a lot of you might have a pet dog or a pet cat or rabbits guinea pigs hamsters that sort of thing and um and the thing with pets is that you you kind of get to know what they need, don't you? You kind of get to know when they need to eat and when they need to exercise and, um, you know, when they when they want to go outside and um, you, you, you get to know your pet and you get to know what's best for them. You know, this morning I looked on Facebook and a friend of mine, um, she had a post on Facebook saying, I want a fridge. Can anyone lend me a fridge for six months? I wonder what that was for. And as I read on, I could see she has a pet tortoise and it's just gone into hibernate now, a bit earlier than expected. And she um, she's looking for a fridge to put the tortoise in for the next six months so it can hibernate at a, at a constant temperature. And you know, there's all these things that we know our pets need. We know what they need for the best. You see, the sheep here, there's some here behind me as well, look. They are terrible for trying to escape sheep are always i'm no farmer but i think if you ask a sheep farmer they'll tell you that sheep are always getting out of places they look for a hole to squeeze through and even if they can't fit they just keep trying until they get stuck um and they're sometimes they could be a bit simple sheep and but the reality is the best place for these sheep is right here because right here there's food for them there is protection uh if they get poorly they're they're cared for and uh, this is the best place for them, but sometimes they don't realize that. Sometimes our, our pets and animals don't realize that they can be in the best place possible because they are cared for by, by you. And um, you know, the Bible talks about Jesus as a, as a shepherd, doesn't it? And I wanna read you something from uh, John chapter 10, it's verse 11 to 15, it says this. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will leave the sheep because they aren't his and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's merely hired and has no real concern for the sheep. But listen to this, this is Jesus talking now. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. You know, Jesus is talking about sheep and shepherds, but what he's actually talking about is us. We are the sheep and Jesus is the good shepherd. 
and he loves us so much that he was willing to lay his life down for us. Just like we, we, know what, we know what's best for our pets, that we know what they need, we know when they need to eat, we know when they need to exercise. Do you know what? Jesus knows what is best for you and he knows what is best for me. And this morning I want to tell you that he loves you so much that he gave his life for you. That the shepherd gave his life for the sheep and perhaps you're, perhaps, however old you are this morning, perhaps you didn't know that. Perhaps you're watching this, this is the first time you've watched one of these videos and you didn't realise this. But I want to tell you that Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his life for you. And he knows what's best for you. He wants to look after you. So I want to tell you, um, children, this morning that... Um, perhaps it doesn't feel like you're always in the best place. Perhaps you want to go and do things that maybe you know you shouldn't do. Well, I want to encourage you to, to listen to what the shepherd is saying. Read the Bible. Listen to what Jesus is saying to you because he wants what's best for your lives. He wants you to be in the best place you can be. And he loves you so much he gave his life for you. So I want to pray and then uh, we're going to carry on. So Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the good shepherd, a shepherd that loves us, that cares for us, that gave his life to save us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And I pray for the children and young people uh, that, Lord, as they are remaining at school during this lockdown, I pray you'll be with them, that you'll help them uh, to, to focus and to make the most of this time, I pray. Just be with them and keep them safe this week as well. In Jesus' name, amen. will lead me home 
Your goodness will lead me home. Today's reading is from Matthew 5, 1 to 11. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Well, good morning to you. At a recent family meal, our youngest grandson, George, whose photograph you might just see over my shoulder, um, said he'd like to say grace, which he promptly did, which surprised us all, because he's quite a cheeky chappy. I have no idea where he gets it from. Um, and it was just lovely, really, just to, to be able to get him to say that quite out of the blue. It reminded me of uh, the times when I was very, very young, a long, long time ago, uh, when mum used to say my prayers with me before I went to sleep at night. And one of those prayers uh, was taken from a hymn by Charles Wesley, obviously being good Methodist, it had to be. But it was simply, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little child, pity my simplicity, suffer me to come to thee. I am listening in my heart, please God call me too, make me gentle, good and kind, always serving you. And then with a big amen at the end of it. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Now, I'm not sure about the theology of mild. It might be there to rhyme with child, but this word meek has been on my mind for the last three or four months, really. It's, a, it's an odd word, isn't it, really, to describe the Son of God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We read in 1 Colossians about how Jesus is the image of God and that he holds all things together, and yet we're using this word meek, it's not out of context. It's a perfectly good word to have there. It's a word that's out of favour within society, which is full of self-centred, self-focused, self-serving, self-absorbed, self-sufficient, selfish attitudes across the board. Meekness sounds, well, like weakness, but actually meekness isn't weakness. In fact, it's strength under control. We read in Colossians, they're saying, who Jesus is, but we read in Isaiah 53 who he was prepared to become to deal with the problem in all of our lives that is sin. It's hard to read those words. And one of the words or the phrases that stands out to me is this phrase where he became silent like a sheep before its share. On the farm, when I was growing up, I used to catch the sheep to help uh, get ready for the shearer and they would struggle and they would fight and they would make noise and they would be trying to get away even though the shearing was for their own welfare but when they were in the hands of a professional shearer they went still and calm and silent and Jesus was prepared to submit to his father's will in order to be the means by which we could be reconciled with his father you know, he grew up as a tender shoot, that verse says in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected. Those are tough words to read when we realise the reason why he was despised and rejected was because of our actions. It's hard for us to understand that we are responsible for what Jesus went through. And if we don't realise that, then we need to. Because the Bible says all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've each turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. God has laid on his own son the iniquity of us all. 
and that he was pierced for our transgressions and he was bruised, crushed for our iniquities. That was the only way by which we could be reconciled. So this word meekness also pops up in our second reading from the Sermon on the Mount, this sort of lines of phrases we call the Beatitudes, when it says the meek will inherit the earth. Well, what does it mean to be meek? I wouldn't say Wikipedia is the best theological source of information, but it defines it as a human attribute, something we choose to do, something we choose to be. It talks about it being humble, teachable, patient under suffering, long-suffering, willing to submit to the teaching of others and putting ourselves second. You remember, as I said, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about the meek inheriting the earth. What does that mean? How can that possibly be? Because we know that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. What it says is, if we are to inherit what God has planned for us, then we need to put aside our own striving for our own uh, importance, for our own uh, best will, but actually to be willing to come before God and to be changed, to be transformed, to be willing to be submissive. Those are not trendy words. You know, you don't hear any politician get up and say, vote for me because I'm a meek politician. You don't hear anyone promoting that as something you should do in order to be more likeable. But if you've been in a room with someone who's self-absorbed, self-sufficient, self-centered, and uh, self-promoting, you won't want to be there very long. They're not nice people to be with. So we can be very different as Christians. We can show that Jesus means something to us by being countercultural. We can be different in the way in which we behave and interact with people around us. Do you remember in Matthew uh, 26 that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's leaving and the mob are coming to arrest him. And Peter draws out his sword and slices off the ear of one of the servants. And Jesus said, look, those who you know draw the sword, they're going to die by the sword. That's not the way. Don't you know I could have called uh, 12 legions of angels, uh, 6,000 in a legion, 72,000 angels would I think have dealt with that mob coming to arrest Jesus. See, Jesus could have called them. He could have called those angels. Those angels exist. They were at the Father's hand, ready to intervene, but it wasn't God's will or purpose. God's will and purpose was that Jesus should be meek. That when he was in the priest's presence and when he was in Pontius Pilate's presence, he didn't struggle or fight or argue as he could have done Pilate gave him every opportunity to defend himself. He didn't take it. Why? Because it wasn't the Father's will that he should struggle or fight or promote himself or save himself. He had to, he knew, lay down his life in order that we might have life in all its fullness. It wasn't God's plan that Jesus should be saved from the cross, it was God's plan that we should be saved from our sin. And that meant that Jesus, in spite of being God's son, in spite of having those angels at his disposal, in spite of being able to avoid the cross, was willing to be humbled even to death on a cross. So therefore for us, we can't turn around and say that we're not particularly meek people. We can't excuse ourselves and say it's not in our character because that's not good enough. It doesn't wash with God. Do you remember those fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They sound familiar. To be God's people, we need to bear fruit. We can't be barren. God calls us into bearing fruit for him and that's the fruit he calls us to bear. And therefore, that is so different from what society has to offer in the main, that it will stand out. It will make us look so different.
to what the world has to offer, especially in this time of uncertainty. And it's not for us to say that's not us as human beings, because actually we are being transformed, the Bible says, and if not, there's something wrong. The Bible says it's a continual process of becoming more Christ-like, more Christ-centred, more Christ-filled, more filled by his spirit, more living the life that he wants us to live and being the people that he wants us to be. Graham Kendrick's song that we're going to sing in a moment says, Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God. Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility and washes our feet. That's what Jesus was willing to become for us. What are we willing to become for him? Are we willing to be transformed? Now, sometimes I hear a great message and at the end of it I'm thinking, but how? This little booklet I've got here, which is uh, A Daily Walk with Selwyn Hughes, said this. It's in a series, the end of a series, on love, and particularly on agape love. And it says this, isn't agape love too high for us to attain? How can we love as God loves? Isn't that just for saints and exceptional people? We love because he first loved us, is written in John 1, 4, 19. Note the word because. To have God's love in us requires us not striving, but receiving. When we focus on the fact that we are loved by the world's greatest lover and open ourselves to that love, it flows like Niagara's waters into our souls. You don't need to strive. You simply have to let it come in. Open your eyes and the light comes in. Open your heart and love comes in. We need to have open hearts this morning to receive God's love into our lives, that we might be transformed, that we might be the people that God wants us to be in the place where he wants us to be, reaching out to the people he wants us to be reaching out to. And one of those things we need to learn is meekness, to set aside what's important to us in order to fully understand and comprehend and then live out what's important to God. Jesus did it. He did it for me. In my response, I pray that God, through our church, through each of us individually, in our lives, by his spirit, might allow us to learn the lesson of being willing to be humble, willing to be meek, willing to set aside our own striving and to be submissive to him, that he might be glorified, that he might be magnified, that he might be lifted up, that men, women and children might be drawn unto him. God bless you. Amen.
offering to give us life, conquering through sacrifice. And as they crucify, praise Father for give. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. Bow down and worship. God the invisible, love indestructible, in frailty appears. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of His throne. Oh, what a So that's it for this week. Thank you so much for joining with us. And I just really hope and pray that as we've spent some time remembering this morning, that most of all, you remember that God loves you, that God is with you and that God will meet all your needs. In a moment, as we finish, we're going to listen to an amazing song, which is a prayer. And it's a prayer that as a church, we pray over each and every one of you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. God bless. See you next week.
blessing, manna rain down from heaven. This isn't second guessing, we know that we are protected. May the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message. Grace and favors in your nature, in your essence. May favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. Be a party and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be a party and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence.